Now, yeah, this is going to be a progress report. Uh, if you bothered to read the abstract that was submitted, it was very generic. It uh, didn't have much in the way of data. Uh, but I'm happy to say that in the month or so since the abstracts were submitted, we have, in fact, made great, made great progress. And I'll try to describe some of that for you today. Uh, first of all, a few facts about uh, bladder cancer. 90% over age 55, half over age 73, four times more likely to occur in men than in women. The lifetime risk for men is 1 in 27, for women, 1 in 85. It's the fourth most common cancer in men. And the U.S. spends $2.2 billion a year in health care for bladder cancer patients compared with $1.4 billion for prostate cancer. Now, if that isn't a blatant cry for attention and for funding, then I don't know how to do it uh, differently. But it was surprising to me that that is, in fact, the case. Low-grade tumors are superficial, less likely to invade or metastasize, frequently reappear after resection, but are amenable to therapy, and the mortality rate is quite low. In contrast, high grade, uh, as uh, you would expect, has a propensity to invade and metastasize. Uh, the mortality is high uh, when it is invasive. A good response to treatment if detected early. In, in terms of the TNM staging, this uh, picture says it all. The focus of this project is muscle invasive form of the disease, that is uh, stage two uh, to stage four. Muscle invasive bladder cancer uh, is uh, 15 to 20 percent of patients with the early stage uh, progress to muscle invasive, but 80 percent of patients with muscle invasive cancer have presented uh, de novo uh, with those late stages. Distant metastases are most common cause of treatment failure. They appear to be present at the time of cystectomy, and they occur in 40 to 50 percent within two years without additional therapy. So in other words, this disease is not as familiar to many of us uh, as prostate cancer, breast cancer, uh, but it is a major killer and poses uh, considerable problems for us in terms of therapy. Uh, cisplatinum based multi-agent chemotherapy is the standard of care, uh, both for neovadjuvant uh, therapy prior to cystectomy and for treatment of measurable metastatic disease. Surprisingly, perhaps, there have been no new FDA-approved drugs for muscle-invasive bladder cancer in over two decades. What we see in terms of uh, the survival statistics uh, is suggested by these two plots, uh, one comparing neoadjuvant and control, and the other metastatic disease treated uh, either with gemcitabine, uh, cisplatin, or with another cisplatin-based uh, regime. And the basic message here is that there are a percentage who do pretty well with this disease after muscle invasion, uh, but we don't really know very much about the 20 percent who do and the 80 percent who don't. Now, TCGA's projects obviously aren't set up and designed to answer that particular question, but one can hope that the kinds of molecular information we're developing uh, will be helpful, uh, at least at the level of clues, if not statistics, uh, in arriving at better therapy. Now, here are the leaders of the working group. Uh, Seth and I are the co-chairs. I would like to emphasize the role of the coordinators. Uh, first of all, Chad Creighton, who's done a superb job of rounding up the data. He's, the, in the terminology, the data wrangler, and has also provided much of the, uh, of the material for this presentation. Also, uh, Rehan Akbani on the analysis side has done a fine job, as has Margie Sheth. Among her 20 different uh, tumor types that she's handling, uh, she has somehow found time uh, to do a remarkably, uh, a, a remarkably uh, good job with us. Manuscript coordinator is Maggie, sorry for the spelling, there's no E on Maggie Morgan uh, from Baylor. Uh, who has helped us to put together text. And then when we saw early on from the first 28 samples as a result of work by Jagel Kim and co-workers that the chromatin remodeling was a major theme in bladder cancer as it was in renal cancer and as it's appeared in the other cancer types, we established a special subgroup uh, for chromatin remodeling studies under David, uh, Jonathan, and Peter. 
Well, of course, there is a much larger group who have been involved one way or another uh, in this working group. I must say that the same as with other working groups, some have really been working, some have been deeply involved, uh, and others uh, have been less so. Clinical data then on the TCGA samples per se. Uh, again, as I said, muscle invasive urothelial cancer allowing mixed histology up to 9%. 126 samples uh, in the data freeze that we are intending for the marker paper. 153 qualified, 138 in the pipeline. When I say that we're intending for the freeze, uh, this is a little different from what you've seen with respect to other projects because we haven't gotten to our first data freeze, and I'll come back to that in just a moment. In terms of gender, males 72%, females 28%, Caucasians 85%, median age 69 with a wide spread, and follow-up highly variable uh, but with a median of 209 days. In terms of the events, uh, 10 progressed, 35 deaths for 126 patients, the progression was out of 31. Staging, shown here, uh, you'll see that the majority were stage three and no node negative. There is one who's listed as stage one and exactly what the status of that particular sample in relation to this study uh, is awaiting patho pathology review. Here is the incidence of regional node uh, involvement. Most, as I said, are, uh, are node negative. And here the AJCC stage is pretty much evenly divided among stages two to four. Smoking history is important in bladder cancer as in several of the other cancer types, or I guess all the cancer types. Out of the 126 patients, as you'll see, the most common uh, were reformed smokers for more than 15 years, or at least those who claim to be reformed smokers uh, for more than 15 years. So the status of the project. Accrual was a limiting factor, uh, but uh, recently accelerated thanks to hard work and cracking of the whip by Kenna uh, and uh, Seth Lerner, who provided much of the material that I've described to you uh, on the clinical aspects of this project. Uh, we had a productive face-to-face -face meeting in Houston in October, that is last month. I'll come back to that uh, at the end of the talk. The data freeze at 126 samples with the plus normals was decided upon. That'll probably be in about two weeks. Uh, the SNP calls are the last and validations are the last things to come in along with the pathology uh, re-evaluation. This is a little different from what you've seen from other uh, sorts of uh, projects. Even the thyroid project uh, at least had a, a month or so after the first data freeze. We decided that in order to move things along quickly uh, that we would do as much as we could toward the marker paper and toward mature analysis as early as possible, even if we knew uh, that we didn't have the final data sets. Uh, so the data and analyses presented here will be what in the world of clinical trials might be called an interim look. Uh, you'll be seeing them on all the data slides with the term preliminary analysis, which is meant to signal to you uh, that there is more mature information to come. We are making fast progress on the marker paper, and I'll describe that to you later. So on to the data. Uh, here is what you will recognize as the usual uh, mutsig, uh, significantly mutated gene compendium. I will point out MLL2, uh, which will come back uh, in later part of the discussion, uh, TP53, uh, KDM6A, uh, ARID1A, other familiar genes that you've seen with other tumor types are frequently mutated. Here is the, are the logistic calls, and again, I will just leave this up for a moment. I'm not going to try to describe it in detail since it is interim, but you'll see again some of our old favorites represented here. Here's an unsupervised clustering of the methylation data. You'll see that there seem to be four uh, categories here. Uh, uh, it was given to us as unsupervised and, and I would have to ask Peter whether it is uh, representative of all of the genes or genes uh, unbiased filtered or not, but in any case, uh, this is the clustering uh, and uh, as it came up. As I say, on the lower right hand of these slides, you'll see a best attempt to give credit where credit is due. 
an mRNA analysis based on subtypes showing apparently three. This is definitely a supervised analysis by Yuxin Lu and Wei Zhang. And also here uh, is, and I'm sorry this is mislabeled, it's not supercluster, it's mRNA clustering uh, supervised in relation to gene ontology terms. On the right, and I'm sorry this didn't come out well in the reproduction, are the FDRs for the ability of genes in each of these GO categories uh, to distinguish between these two apparent uh, clusters of, of samples. This is from Katie Hoadley and Billy Kim. Here is uh, unsupervised consensus clustering of the microRNA data. You've seen this kind of figure before in the other talks and previously. Uh, seem to be most likely four, uh, four different uh, clusters by this analysis from uh, the British Columbia group. Here is a clustering of the RPPA data. Uh, principally by, uh, uh, by Rehan Agbani. You'll see at the top, which you probably, some of you in the front will be able to make out, but I don't want to stress it, are bars which represent the relationship between this clustering and a num number of both technical batch effect possibilities to explain clusters and then other sorts of analyses that have been done. This is represented on poster uh, that you probably saw yesterday. Here is the supercluster result. That's a new algorithm that uh, Rehan uh, developed uh, for putting together information uh, from a number of different types of data. In this case, mutation, microRNA, uh, copy number, uh, DNA methylation, mRNA, RPPA. It shows if you stretch the imagination a bit, two to three clusters, but not really a dramatically good correspondence among the different uh, types of information in terms of what they're suggesting uh, about the categories of these uh, samples. Here is uh, a uh, vignette on fusion protein. This is FGFR3 TAC3 from uh, Raju's laboratory. Uh, Xiaoping Su uh, has similar data showing this kind of, of fusion protein. In fact, there are a large number of fusion proteins and, uh, that have shown up. They remain to be validated. And what I'm showing you here is just a, an example and a prominent example of such fusions. Splice variation is a significant feature of these data sets. This is an analysis uh, due to Mike Ryan using his elegant SpliceSeq uh, program package. In this case, it's showing the splice variation in CD44, that is exon skip in heavy smokers as opposed to non-smokers. Here are the statistics compiled uh, by that program. What you see in, in red is the heavy smokers, green is uh, the non-smokers, and there is an exon skip event which is prominent in the smokers, but not the non-smokers. Again, there are many different uh, apparent splice variations that show up. Some interesting stories in that for future tellings. Viral integration is uh, significant in this case. This is from analysis by Xiaoping Su. Four samples have integration sites for four different viruses, uh, HPV-16, which is, of course, important uh, for cervical and other cancers, uh, 45 and 56 variants, and also BK. This is from the first 85 samples uh, ready for analysis. Other three samples uh, with, uh, viral, uh, with viral sequences don't have any detected integration sites. That's for HPV-6 and CMV. Now, you'll note that in a couple of cases, DEC1 is uh, the integration site. I, as an aside, will point out to you a problem if you are laundering your data sets on genes at any time through Excel. Uh, Excel, in its infinite wisdom, uh, will turn DEC1 into one hyphen DEC, thinking it's a date. Uh, this is irreversible. You can't retrieve uh, the original form, and it's hard to get around uh, uh, if, for example, you're cutting and pasting into Excel, even if you try to format uh, the fields in Excel appropriately. There are about 30 genes we found a while back uh, that have this problem in Excel, so they may be lost to your searches forever if you're not cognizant of the fact. 
uh, incidentally, this program package, VirusSeq, uh, pr uh, principally uh, from Xiaoping Su, just came out a few days ago in bioinformatics, uh, so you may not have seen it yet. It is useful. There's another set of uh, viral integration studies being done by Raju's, uh, Raju's group, and there will be others, uh, I assume. So, chromatin remodeling. This is a very interesting story that has developed. Uh, I don't know how exactly to give the, the credit to the working group except to show you the title from Tatoshi's slide, which you can still see today, represents individuals from a number of institutions. In case you can't read it, uh, here it is in large print. Uh, Peter Laird is the senior uh, partner in that effort. I'm going to show you just a bit of it. It's too complex a story to go into uh, in depth. Here what you see is epigenetic modifiers mutated in more than three samples out of the hundred analyzed uh, to that point. And you'll see, again, if you peruse the labels on the left, uh, if you can see them in the front, that uh, there are some old favorites, ARID uh, 1A, MLL2, MLL3 uh, among them. And here are the five uh, that reached uh, significance by statistical criteria. Obviously, these are not all that may, in fact, uh, be significantly mutated if we have larger sample size. I'm going to be focusing on MLL2 uh, since that's a novel story. MLL2 uh, mutation has not previously been reported in bladder cancer uh, specifically. So here is the information on MLL2. Uh, it's a complex and very interesting story that involves, for example, a difference between methylation of the body of the gene and of the promoter region of the gene. Rather than trying to tell you that story, uh, this is information that is, again, uh, on the poster uh, that is presented by Toshi. You can look at it, talk with Peter, or talk uh, with Toshi uh, about it in detail. And finally, among the data slides, uh, this is our draft pathway figure put together uh, by Chad Creighton. You'll recognize the format of it. Again, I'm not going to try to go through it in detail given the time available, but you'll see that it involves the P53RB pathway, the RTK RAS PI3 kinase pathway, uh, histone modifications, uh, which are part of the chromatin story, uh, and so forth. Well, that's, uh, that, those are the kinds of data that are being rapidly developed even before our data freeze. What I'd like to do in closing is to say just a few words about how we're approaching writing the marker paper. Uh, it's an idiosyncratic approach in some ways, and it may, as a story, be useful to other groups who are approaching that task, or perhaps other groups who already had the experience uh, can tell us why we're wrong in the way we're doing it. As I said, accrual was slow, accelerated recently. Uh, we wanted to get as fast a start as we could toward the marker paper as soon as a reasonable amount of the data, the majority of the data for the freeze uh, was, uh, were available. So what we did last month at our workshop uh, was to ask for volunteers uh, to write sections of the paper and volunteers to lead uh, in developing the figures for the paper. Uh, it, we don't want these to be cookie cutter papers, but on the other hand, there, if you go back through uh, the papers published to date, there are certain common features. There's a section of text and an accompanying figure on mutation and copy number. There's a section on expression, there, et cetera. So in fact, uh, four out of five of the figures uh, fit a stereotype as to what kinds of information uh, one wants to include. And similarly, uh, I went back through the text of the papers counted the words that were devoted and the sections that were there uh, for various pieces that canonically appear in the marker papers. And then we assigned those, or people self-assigned themselves, to be responsible for turning those in. And in fact, uh, within, uh, within a few days uh, of the time that we uh, put the screws to them uh, to have it ready, and this took us up to yesterday, we in fact got all the contributions in terms of draft sections of the paper uh, and draft figures uh, for four out of five figures uh, for the paper. The fact that we had word counts and assigned a, a 
re reasonably approximate word counts meant that it freed those who were developing these sections from having to write pages and pages, supplements to come later, and this task seems, to this point at least, uh, to have gone uh, very smoothly. So now the next stage when we get the, uh, the actual data freeze will be to update the analyses and then to uh, to uh, perform the task of integrating all of them and integrating the text so that it doesn't look as though it was written by a committee or by disparate individuals. So with that, uh, I will stop and uh, be glad to take questions. Uh, we have a few minutes left for questions. <clears throat> uh, thanks, John. That was a great talk. Um, in other cancers, the presence of a virus has occasionally be, been linked to a specific mutation spectrum. So I wonder in this case if you have seen a difference in mutation spectrum in those cases with virus present. Uh, it's an interesting question. Uh, is uh, Xiaoping here? Okay. Let me tell you. Yeah, so, so as Gaddy says, that's actually the finding that led us to find viruses in, in, in the bladder cancer. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, as, I, as I suggested, multiple groups have been looking at this and glad to say that, uh, that maybe for once the results appear to be uh, quite concordant. So, uh, John, I actually wanted to ask about a, a different finding, which is the report of um, CDKN1A mutations. Yes. So CDKN1A encoding um, uh, P21 is, uh, you know, one of the sort of growth suppressive genes that's never been seen before uh, to be mutated in cancer. And I wonder if you can comment on the nature of those mutations, if they look like tumor suppressor mutations, uh, and uh, if they're mutually exclusive with P53 mutations or not. Yeah, yeah Jagel, are you here? Or is someone from that uh, the group who's looked at those data closely? Yeah, uh, Citikin, uh, Citikin, uh 1A is the uh, mostly truncating mutation, so it's a loss of function mutations, but we couldn't find the significant mutual exclusivity between Citikin 1A and TPP3. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, we're ahead of schedule. Sorry, yes. Can you just briefly comment on the frequency of the structural variation in uh, FGFR3 TAC3? To comment on the frequency. Yeah, uh, it's very frequent, very rare. Right now, it's a three out of 85. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Other questions? All right, we are a couple of minutes ahead of schedule. <clears throat> 